Hello and welcome one and all. We are back to look at yet another episode of Comrider Saber. Uh, this time we are on episode 40 or chapter 40, Shining Friendship, the Three Swordsmen. This is basically the first big reunion of uh, the boys, uh, <laughs> not not the Neff, not the uh, Amazon Prime show, of uh, Toma, Rentaro, and Kento all returning together, joining forces yet again to, uh, no, no, save the world and fight against Solomon. So this is their big trendy reunion fight, and, uh, well, we'll talk about that. So, yeah, let's dig into the episode. So our episode actually starts off with Reika and uh, Ryoga, uh, say, uh, Sabella and Durandal, in Southern Base. Uh, yeah, it's, it's Southern Base. And they're basically discussing how they want to, you know, beat Solomon and restore Southern Base back to its former glory. And then Solomon pops in and unveils a new power. Uh, he can, I guess, because of his own authority with his uh, book, can take control over... The, uh, the sacred sword and the book and the swordsman. Basically, he's puppeteering them and giving them orders to do stuff. So he tells Durandal to kill Sabella. And then he just fucks off. Uh, because his master plan is to capture Luna because Luna has returned to the world because Toma has the book, uh, sacred has the sacred sword, the cross saber. And also Tassel's back, I forgot to mention him. And he's flying around trying to chase Luna as well. Because they want to keep her out of Master Logos' hands, out of Isaac's hands. So Isaac uh, basically has a giant plan that will hopefully distract everybody. As he's, you uh, know, he's distracting the Randall, so he thinks that will be enough. And he takes off to try to go find Luna. Uh, it is then that Yuri tells everyone, hey, my friend's back. He told me what this is going on. Luna's back. And then... Uh, Reiki comes in and she she projects a mist clone of herself, a steam clone, and tells everyone that, hey, I need help. My brother is acting out of control and help me save him because he's begging, so he's begging, he's literally begging her to strike me down before I hurt you because, you no, know, he's being controlled. He can mentally, he's mentally there, but he has no physical control over himself. Uh, thankfully, he also doesn't seem to be able to use his fucking time stop power, his fucking Crimson King shit, while he's under mind control, because he just doesn't do it. Uh, I guess because, you know, it's more complicated just swinging the sword around randomly. Anyway, uh, Master Lagos decides to chase out the Luna, and it's creepy as all hell, because Luna's still this little girl, and I really would have hoped they would have used the excuse to age her up so that we could potentially avoid some of the creepiness of this grown-ass man chasing this little girl with that laughter. Uh, but I will have to say, Isaac is at his best when he's hamming it the fuck up, and he is like 110% ham in this episode. So, well, that's good. <laughs> uh, because, you no, know, he he's basically on his last nerve. He's losing everything. Uh... And he's on this. He's on his last nerve again. So you know he tries to get get Luna. Uh, that doesn't work because not only does Toma, Kento, and Rentaro show up to stop him, but Yuri uses the source of light and darkness to basically beat him back when he's about to reach Luna and Wonderworld. And uh, and then he is pushed out. But Yuri jumps in and he uses his mind. Uh, not really mind control powers, but his super control powers to keep Yuri in sword form and claim the source of light and darkness because Kento gave Yuri the source of light and darkness and gives Yuri the sword of darkness at the beginning of the episode as a sign that he's no longer caliber, which is extremely fucking sad. I honestly would have liked it if Kento got some kind of fusion form between caliber and Espada, especially because, uh... Like, they transform, and his strongest form as a spider is still his combo, which is really fucking sad, and makes me keep going, man, someone give my boy a power-up. I know we're in the last stretch of the series, but come on, man. You, you can't give this dude a caliber and then just have him rock a combo for the rest of the series, because you know, that just gonna, ain't gonna work, especially because of what happens in this episode. Uh, but we'll talk about that. In a minute. Anyway, 
anyway, they fight. Uh, they honestly do a really good job fighting off fighting off uh, Solomon in a really cool display. And they do a triple triple rider kick on him. I forget if it was a kick or a slash, but they basically do a triple attack on him. That beats him back temporarily. Uh, everyone's happy. And then he says, fuck it, gets back up, transforms again, and uses his power control. Uh, tries to use it on Toma, but it doesn't work. He's like, oh, well, obviously that wouldn't have worked. And then he uses it on Rentoro and Kento. And it works on them. And so Toma has to fight slash dodge their attacks. And he's doing a good job of it. And honestly, they're showing a lot of physical restraint and helping the and help keeping themselves back from hurting Toma, with Rentoro freezing himself and Kento literally holding his sword back with his other hand. Uh, I forgot to mention the other subplot of like Durandal basically rampaging, and so Slash and Buster go to deal with that, and they're basically doing the whole. We're fighting you to help. We're fighting you, but also not fighting you at the same time. Basically, trying to restrain him from hurting himself or Sabella, while he desperately begs them to strike him down so he, you know, doesn't hurt her accidentally. And it's honestly kind of touching. Uh, I really would have liked it better <laughs> if I liked the Randall a bit more. Like he's a decent character, but they haven't really given him much to do outside of being stoic as fuck. So. I honestly don't know how he thinks of his sister. Like, we, like he's shown to be the cold, distant type, and she respects the hell out of him, but we don't know how he feels about her. Like, we know that there's some affection there, but he just doesn't show it outwardly, or we haven't seen any moments where he shows affection to her. And that just kind of makes me curious about about how he feels about her. Like, the only time we've seen them have a moment that was just them was where he showed disdain for her, when she was downing Master Logos back when they were super loyal to him. Uh, that was it. <sighs> and since then, we really haven't had any moments to express, hey, how do you two feel about each other now that you know your boss is kind of a dick? Uh, but it's it's fine. The, the, the moment still hits there, even if it doesn't hit as strongly. Uh, anyway, uh, Rintaro and Kento managed to hold back themselves from fighting Toma for five minutes, and Toma calls upon, uh, I guess, the power of their base books. And this somehow, like, I, un I understand why it un like it de-transforms or unmorphs Kento. But why does it do that to Rentaro? Rentaro is in his, like, final form with the the Thousand Beast form thing. Uh, uh, but it don't I don't understand why it would depower Rentaro in any way. But it does. Uh, but anyway, Toma uses a new combo, and it gets a new jingle, obviously. And Toma whoops ass on Max Logos, with Rentoro and Kento acting as kind of backup. Okay, so this is what... The, okay, so this form is kind of confusing to me on this front, because Kento and Rentoro act as kind of support. Like, they're untransformed and acting as support to help Toma use the powers of their form. Because you now Kento swings his sword around, and that somehow summons the magic carpet from Alandina. And you now Rentaro swings his sword around, and that somehow summons the lion out of the chest. And I, my only confusion is so, are they all three of them? Is this form a combination of all three of their powers combined in the both, lit, both literal and physical way? Like, do they have to help Toma control the form? Like, I, I, this raises a, lum, a number of questions about this form, and it makes me wonder, hey, if Toma used the books of the other sorts of logos, how would that work? Would he need, would he need like, Buster's uh, by his side to swing his sword to help him out? Or Kin's on to swing around his sword for him to use his powers a bit? Because he should be able to, because he can use their powers without them, at least there's power of their swords, but I guess what the books is different. Although we really haven't seen, like, Buster or anyone use any specific book power, just know their sword power. Uh, because, no, their, their swords are different, which begs a number of different questions. Uh, because it makes me wonder, hey... If Toma used the Randall and Reika's books, would he be able to use their powers? Which begs another question. 
are their powers more in their swords or their books? Because it seems like uh, Toma and his crew, because they have the same driver, their powers are in their books, not their swords. But for everyone else, their powers are in their swords and not their books. Uh, does that make any sense to anyone? Like, it feels really weird. Like, this weird disconnect. And I don't know why. Like, I know on the production level why, but I need a lore reason why. <sighs> anyway, uh, <laughs> that tangent aside... Uh, Toma and friends beat Isaac, and they have a moment where they solidify themselves. They do their whole swords crossing thing that's always in the outro, and it's honestly pretty cool to see because I honestly do like these three together again. And then May comes in with her big old stick because she feels a little left out of the whole mess because she doesn't have a sword, which is kind of sad. Like, I honestly feel there was a season for the Kamen Rider girl to be given a transformation. It feels like this will be one of the seasons where it will happen. Because, you know, May's whole thing is that she's a member of the crew. And how she's kind of a member, but at the same time she's not a member because she doesn't have her own sword. And I honestly feel this would be a really good moment to have May, like, you know, at least have a token sword. Like, give her a Reka because we still have no idea where the hell Reka is. And she can, like, at least have it or use it as a keepsake. Or maybe even transform her own feminine, her own female version of Saber. I don't know. Maybe? Anyway, uh, they solidify their friendship and Isaac sinks away. And Isaac is in this shit because, you know, he is completely ragged. He's beat up. He's lost, like, super hard. He doesn't have Luna. He lost to Toma again. It's like the third time in a row. And he's just on his last nervous. Also, his book got destroyed. But because, you know... It is that book. It's Solomon. It reconstructs itself. And he's like, yes, I am God. With this book, I am God. And then Soros comes in. And Soros is like, hey, buddy. I'm going to need that book from you. And earlier in the episode, uh, Logos uh, dismissed Soros. But now Soros decides to just fucking kill this fucker. Take the, take the Solomon book. And walks off because, no, he is the final boss. And he's basically, you know, has his ba big grand master plan uh, that apparently we're going to be getting into about what happened 2,000 years ago with. And I hope the explanation's good because there are a lot of things I am asked. I'm honestly surprised we haven't explored yet in terms of the series. But, uh, yeah, let's get into that part of the episode, shall we? Okay, so ultimately... I ultimately kind of like this episode, if only for it being uh, Isaac as Solomon's last episode. Uh, we don't know if, like, the uh, story else will become the new Solomon, considering how powers can be traded around in this series so easily. Uh, but here is my biggest problem with the series, at least one element of the series that I just realized after watching this episode. We haven't really been given a proper explanation about what Wonder World actually is. Like, we know it's this supposedly magical place where mystical stuff and magic happens, and that is tied to the Book of Destiny and the Wonder Ride books and stuff like that, but we don't have a true explanation about what exactly it is. Uh, take, for example, just to use another season that has the whole dual world concept, Comrade Ghost. Uh, this again, I'm just using the, the fact that it's a dual world concept, not that it's written by the same dude. Uh, in Ghost, like, it, like for the first part of the series, we're a complete mystery about what the other world is. I forget what the world's name is. And we're early on, we're let's believe it's like the spirit world, ghost, and all that kind of stuff. And then later on, in the second half of the show, we get a full explanation of the world, especially because we have... Uh, fuck, I'm forgetting his name. Uh, the third writer of that season, who's from that world, actually he's a royal prince of that world, who we get an explanation about what that world is like and what it's about. It's still, ultimately, uh, like, we, like, we finally understand that world, why it is the way it is, at least partially why it is the way it is, uh, why... They are like that and other such things. For Wonder World, we still don't have that space for that. We don't even know if anyone lives here 
outside of Tassel. The Megiddo aren't naturally from Wonderworld. They were created by the Megiddo who were generals. And we know from flashbacks already that Storios and the other two were originally humans who went into Wonderworld and became Megiddo. So again, the Megiddo aren't naturally from Wonderworld, which begs the question, again, what is Wonderworld? Uh, to use another series of dual world concept, Gaim and the Yggdrasil Forest, like, early on, we don't have any explanation about this fucking forest. It's just a mysterious location that will turn you into a monster if you eat the food. Uh, the, the fruits, and the fruits are very tempting, and it's also the source of all the Comrider powers. Again, very much like Saber. But, part two of the series, we give it a full explanation about what the Easter Still Forest is and where it's connected to currently. As that forest is basically kind of an kind of a space parasite kind of thing that would go from world to world attaching itself to different worlds as a form of test for that sentient species. I'll explain more properly in game when I eventually get to that show in like fucking five years. And oh god, that's gonna be that's gonna be a long one because Gaim's my favorite season. <laughs> mm. Anyway, so even then, we get an explanation about what the series is. And in both cases, we get an explanation about what these other worlds are, like, late 20s, early 30s. Like, so for the latter half of the series, we know exactly what the stakes are, what's going on, all that kind of stuff. But in Saber's case, we don't have an explanation about what Wonder World actually is. We only know it's a mystical land, and apparently people who go there can be turned into Megiddo, and apparently, uh, apparently, you know, Luna's connected to it somehow. Like she was born from Wonder World, or apparently something like that. And she chooses somebody, and that person also becomes one, one Wonder World in a way. Uh, again, I raised with a ton of questions, and hopefully, and like leaving some of these questions unanswered to the latter half of the season, latter part of the series. That's fine. That, that that can serve as a good way to drop some mystery. But in this specific case, not having a base explanation about Wonder World or how it specifically works detracts a bit from the series. Especially because Wonder World has, like early on in the series, it was, oh, they're merging Wonder World and our world, so we have to stop it. And you know, that was the early part of the series, and then the latter part, it was about all the swords, gathering the swords, and all that kind of stuff, which, look, that's fine, that works, you, this this could have all worked out, but again, Wonder World got dropped as less important as gathering the swords was becoming more important, and again, it makes the question, the book of, is the Book of Destiny tied to Wonder World specifically, or is it just located in Wonder World? And what exactly is Wonder World? Because we still don't have an explanation about that. We, there's a lot of questions about the Book of Destiny, and obviously questions about Luna, which hopefully all these will be answered next week. Uh, I know at least the Luna question will potentially be answered because Tassel's around, as well as you know questions about what Tassel is exactly is. Is he was the last person that was chosen by the girl who chooses? Uh, again, there's there are a lot of questions abound. Uh, anyway, despite all of that, when it gets down to just the base drama level of that like, just Toma and the boys, I actually like that part of the episode. I like over uh, the reunion between the three, uh, their camaraderie restored, uh, Kento go, now now father complex free, and now without Shadow the Hedgehog levels of edge. Now, Kento suspected being Kento. I still feel sad that he doesn't keep Caliber. Like, it makes sense to give it to Yuri. I mean, outside of this instance of Master Logos using mind control powers on Yuri. Uh, but it makes sense to give Caliber to Yuri because Yuri knows how to use Caliber. And he can use Caliber's uh, sort of darkness for that whole ceiling attack thing that he did. And not only did he do it to Bach in the past, which sealed him away for uh, to near forever, but also did it to Master Logos at one point, and that was a pretty good play. Uh, so, you know, 
if all things fail, we can just have Yuri's sealing technique, which, while it won't be permanent from the looks of it, it will still give the characters time and when when, when they need them. Uh, yeah. So I like that. I like it makes sense, but I still hate it because it just leaves Kento with, oh well, all I have now is just my combo. And it feels like, you know, maybe they can give Kento some kind of upgrade if they want to. Like, th like they have the data left over from Draconic Knight and shit like that. So maybe they could give him an upgrade. I honestly doubt they would. Like, maybe in, like, a V-Cinema, he'll get an upgrade similar to Draconic Knight and King Lion Senki. But, you know, until that specific V-Cinema, he's just gonna stay. Well, I guess my strongest form is my combo. Uh, makes me just question other things. Uh... If Saber does future V cinemas, would would uh, Rintaro not only get a new sword but a a new form, but also a new sword, and would Kento be given the same treatment? I kind of hope so. Uh, just just because. So yeah, we don't have a full explanation about what Wonder World is. Uh, hopefully, we'll get a full explanation about Luna in the next week's episode. And hopefully we'll figure out what exactly Storios' plan here is. Because so far his plan has been get everyone else around me killed to accumulate more mysterious powers from myself in the background for some scheme. Because not only does he have Solomon's book now, he also has his Sophia clone thing that we haven't seen since he made her. So she's obviously not going to be a character, but she's just going to be there to be a plot device. And we still have Ren wandering around like a like a fucking latchkey kid child who just doesn't want to go home. And I kind of wanted him to ask to do some more, but I doubt that they will at this point, considering how how little episodes we have and how they have to eventually start answering some of the questions that are built up, and then maybe give me a disappointing <laughs> answers. Uh, I mean, I don't have that many high hopes because again, Saber for me is a pretty mid tier series. Uh, like lower mid, uh, not 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 low tier, but lower mid. I don't hate it. I still have things I like. Like I, again, I like the camaraderie between Kento, Toma, and Rintaro, uh, and May, and also Yuri now. But if you expand that to the whole group as a whole, I honestly don't feel that. Like especially from Sophia herself, because she still does that thing where she refers to the group by their writer names. And it feels, I mean, obviously outside of May, and it feels kind of, uh, it feels kind of like she's pushing him away in a sense. Like, earlier on, I could maybe see that because, you no, know, it was her fate to sacrifice herself in a place of Luna for the Book of Destiny. Uh, at least that was her main purpose in being given life. But she's a failure at that, and now she's a, and she's a charge of Northern base as a result of that. And this just begs several questions about Sophia, and also questions about why Luna hasn't aged. I'm, again, I really was hoping that they would replace the child actress for Luna with one who's at least a teenager. Uh, if only so the scenes could be less creepy of Master Logos laughing his ass off, chasing after this girl as like a fucking giant wall master hand. Uh, like he's not, he's not actually chasing after her as a hand. He's projecting his hand uh, through a portal to try to snatch her up. And that doesn't sound any better out loud now, does it? <sighs> Again, overall, my biggest problem with Saber is still going to be uh, the lack of explanation about most things and how large the cast is. But I can honestly respect some elements of the show and I honestly wish that we were given a bit more background information on a number of different things. Uh, so, episode of the whole is okay. Again, low mid-tier. Mid-tier episodes. Like, the past few episodes have been pretty decent to okay. Nothing, nothing too outstanding, even with the Final Forum debut. So, yeah. With that said, I'll be seeing all of you guys again next week as we ramp down to the series finale. Hopefully they can, they mean they've tumbled throughout most of the show, so hopefully they can stick some form of a landing. And with that said, until next time everybody.